It was such a joy for me this morning to hear from one of our visitors from last Sunday, Lord, that you touched him and healed his hands from a condition, that you're a miracle-working God, and that he's here today to thank you for touching him and pray for uh, his whole future that it might be one that could be irradiated by your wonderful and glorious presence. We thank you, Lord, for Thelma coming to uh, visit us last week and wanting to come back today, and we ask your grace and your favor upon her. We thank you for Wendy having overcome the uh, transport problem, and uh, it's just such a joy to us that she's back here today. And we thank you that we don't have any more people tripping overseas and, and spending their whole lives in Africa or somewhere when we've got Australia right here and we've got Uluru right here. Thank you that you're a good God. Thank you that you love us with an everlasting love. And today, Lord, we just uh, pray now that you'll open our hearts to hear the preaching of your word and the ministry of your spirit into our lives. And we pray your favor and blessing upon Bruce Thompson as he shares your word and on his dear wife for coming and supporting him for this weekend of ministry. We ask this now in Jesus' name. And everyone said, so, Amen. Thank you for having me again this morning. And when I was asked to come and preach, for me, it's never really a, a, an issue of what am I going to speak about. It's not I've got to go and I've got to prepare a message. I like to share what God's doing in my life, what God's speaking to me about, and therefore what I'm saying is my own personal freshness, and that's what I'm going to be giving you this morning. And so... My title this morning, if we've got PowerPoints coming up, yes, they're coming up, is called Going Deeper. And I got this at the end of last year, thinking about 2024. So let's go to the next slide. So God was challenging where I've been spiritually in 2023 is not going to get me where God wants me to go in 2024. You know, I can't rely. That's the past. That's gone. And he challenged me, I need to go deeper. And that's my, my theme to you this morning. We, I need to go deeper, but we all need to go deeper. And we're going to look at that. And God was giving me Ezekiel 47 as, as the basis of studying that. Now, I want to read the whole passage. I think it's 12 verses out of Ezekiel 27. And then we'll come back and we'll start picking it apart. So let's go to our first slide. The man brought me back to the entrance of the temple. I saw water coming from under the threshold of the temple towards the east. For the temple faced east. The water was coming from under the south side of the temple south of the altar. He then brought me out through the north gate and led me along the outside of the outer gate facing east. And the water was trickling from the south side. Next slide. As the man went eastward and measuring a line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits and then he led me through water that was ankle deep. He measured off another thousand cubits and he led me through water that was knee-deep. He measured off another thousand and led me through water that was up to the waist. Next. He measured off another thousand and now. It was a river that could not cross because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in. A river that no one could cross. He asked me, son of man, do you see this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. He said to me, this water flows towards the eastern region and goes towards a river where it enters the Dead Sea. When it empties into the sea, the salty water becomes fresh. 
Swarms of living creatures will live there, wherever the water flows. There will be large numbers of fish because the water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, seeing everything will live. Fishermen will stand on the shore from Engedi to and Lagum. There will be places of spreading of nets. The fish will be of many kinds, like the fish of the Mediterranean Sea. But the swamps and the marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. Fruit trees of many kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. I want to go back and and look, so we'll go on our next slide, and, and break that down. Verse 1, I saw water. Watching. There's no interaction with the water at this stage. And this, I believe, represents believers that are not committed, they're just spectators. And unfortunately, I believe the church has really emphasised making believers, making spectators. And this platform has become a performance. You know, we can have smoke machines and we can have lights and we can have... It's a performance these days. We've lost something because we're looking for spectators to sit in those pews and just watch what's going on in the platform. God said, make disciples. God said, make people not just spectators, but are interacting, that are involved, that are going beyond the just watching. My history is that my great-grandfather was actually in the Baptist church, so you kind of have a, a lineage of Baptist, you know, though I never was belonged to the Baptist. My great-grandfather... And my grandfather belonged to the Baptist church when Smith Wheelsworth came to Sydney. And they started the Pentecostal movement based on Smith Wigglesworth. And my mother would come uh, with my grandfather and, and that she would go around New South Wales and they would be preaching. Well, she married my father. And my father was also a minister and he was minister at Rockdale. My grandfather was an internationally known and recognised minister. And some of you may have heard a Korean pastor called Yong Yi Cho. Well, my grandfather was in the World Pentecostal Conference in Brazil, and the chairman at the time introduced a young Korean pastor, and he said, can you please mentor this Korean pastor whose name was Yong Yi Cho? Years later... Yong Yi Cho came to Australia when my grandfather was old and he made a special point of coming to dinner with our family because of that relationship. And so you can see that he was well known and, and he was invited and he wrote books about the miracles that happened. And I didn't value. You know, I heard the stories as growing up. I didn't value all that experience. And he died and God started speaking to me about moving in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, moving in healing, moving in other areas. And I thought, I never took the opportunity to ask my grandfather about the Holy Spirit, how it moves, how I can be, you know, it was, it was, I just didn't take that time. And so when my, grand, my father was also a minister and... He was dying. I said, I'm not going to miss this opportunity. And I, at the hospital, um, before I had to fly out to Thailand, I sat down and asked him, tell me about the moving of the Holy Spirit. Tell me about things. I want to learn. 
She said, oh, yeah, I can tell you. I went to the big preachings of Old Roberts in Australia and the big healing meetings. I found out, I didn't even know at that point, that just after I married, you know, he went to America and to Sweden. There was a big revival in Sweden. He said, I saw it all in Sweden, all the big revivals. I've seen all the big preachers. I've seen them all. And you know what? I was disappointed. He was a watcher. He wasn't a participator. He couldn't tell me anything because he hadn't gone to that next step. And I said, that's not going to be me. Whatever I do, I'm going to teach people. I'm going to tell people because we can't let the things die. He was a spectator. We cannot rest at being spectators. And so they saw the water coming out of the temple. Next slide. Where was it coming from? It was coming from the throne of God. Now, if you look at the temple, it had various parts of it, but it was coming from the center, from the holiest of holies. And it, was, it says it was trickling out underneath. But it was going outside the temple, and it was, as it was getting further away from the temple, it was getting deeper and deeper. That's a miracle. Because it was trickling out, it should have been spreading out and getting shallower and shallower. And so the miracle is, as we go in God, he can do anything. Like he multiplied the loaves and the fishes, he's multiplying the blessing, but it starts from the throne of God. And so we've got to recognize the starting point. Next slide. Well, it says he measured off a thousand cubits. Now, I love and I've looked at all these Bibles. So the New King James or the King James and the NIV all use the word cubit. What's a cubit, you say? Well, so some of the other versions have tried to, to put it in there, and, but they get it mixed up. 1,700 feet, 1,500 feet, 500 meters, a third of a mile. Okay? Now, how can these all be correct? And the answer is a cubit is an amma, which means the mother of the arm. From the elbow to the tip of the fingers. And so the reality is, if I'm measuring off a thousand of these, my elbow distance is going to be different to yours. See, we try and what I call McDonaldize the church. Everybody's got to be the same. Every church has got to be the same. You go to a McDonald's anywhere in the world. How do you know? Those yellow M's, those you know, arches. You can see them. You can recognize them. But the church isn't like that. Everybody's different. Every congregation is different. And God is saying we can't McDonaldize our church. We can't make the natural things. It's not a fast food restaurant. You know? And so we've got to understand that when we're going into this river and we're looking at this river, when God is saying, I'm taking you a thousand cubits, mine might be a year, yours might be ten years. We've just got to make sure that we're on that journey of going deeper. And so we go our 1,000 cubits on the next slide. And he led me through the water that was ankle deep. You know, when the water's up to our ankles, we're still able to walk. You know, our feet represent the gospel. They're in the water. Salvations might be happening. And, you know, if you're in the water, you might be kicking it up and splashing it getting a little bit of water. Water represents the Holy Spirit. Yeah, we're splashing. Oh, aren't we having a great time in the Holy Spirit here? 
and we don't realise we're only ankle deep. We're satisfied being ankle deep and then just splashing a bit of water and, did you feel that? Did you feel the water? It was a drop. It was a powerful drop. I have no doubt it was a powerful drop. It was meaningful. But there's more. And we cannot be satisfied with a touch of the Spirit. We've got to go deeper. And that's what God's saying to me, Bruce, you've got to go deeper this year. But what's it look like? Well, let's go deeper into our sermon and go to the next slide. Um, So he measured off another thousand cubits and he led me through water that was knee deep. Well, knees symbolize submission, prayer. You know, the Bible says that the disciples, they, um, they couldn't pray for an hour when Jesus was in the garden. They got tired, you know, but what you're feeling, ankle deep, you're in control. But when the water's up t- to your knees, you're starting to feel a bit of that power. You know, it's starting to come and press. And and people that are in the floods, and there have been floods around here for a while, they say, don't drive in the water. You might think it's only knee deep, but that could be starting to push cars off bridges. Be careful when it goes to knee deep. You might get through. The natural still has an effect but you can feel the power. And there's something different between the ankle and the knees and you begin to feel it. People are saying, oh, I'm swimming in the river. I don't think you are. You're probably still at the ankle. You might even be at the shore. And where I think I am at the best, I'm ankle deep and I need to go more. And I need to go on my knees is how I get to that Next point. Yes, corporate time of prayer, but I need that personal relationship time to bow down. And as he said to the side, it might be an hour. Not with an agenda, not with my shopping list of please bless me this, please bless me that, but just resting and waiting in the time of the Holy Spirit. Oh, next one. And he measured off another thousand and he led me through water that was waist deep. Well, you know, when you're, you're full, you know, the, the fullness of food, you know, sits on your waist. Hips represents the strength of the flesh. But you see, by the time the water's up to your waist, by the time the water's um, up to your hips, Buoyancy is starting to come in. And the rich and the poor are the same in the water. As the buoyancy takes away those that have the fatness and the richness of life and those that don't, they're the same. And I think, you know, we've got to take out those inequalities that might be in the church. We're all the same. And when we're in the river, whether Paul was talking about the slaves or their masters. Sometimes the slaves were actually the pastors of the church, but they're all the same in God. And so as we're going deeper, the the flesh is losing its influence on us. See, when people are injured, Quite often, they'll take them down to pools to start exercising because the buoyancy is actually easier for them to start their recovery. And so they're the same. The flesh dies. so The things of this earth are not available. So our next one. Now... It was a river that could not cross. So we've got another 1,000 metres because the water had risen. It was deep enough to swim. Swimming is that final 
breaking of the resistance of the natural. But when we look at it, we started on our knees. When we're swimming, we're actually face down. Can you see the progress in what we need to do to actually be swimming? And swimming in a river. You know, if we look at a river and think, oh, I can swim across that. I remember at a water hole. Yeah, I can swim across that. And I got about halfway and I thought, oh, I might need to rest here before I go on. Even though I was a good swimmer, it was further. It took more effort. This is a river that's so vast it can't be crossed. It was a river that had grown from a trickle. It came out of that temple, but the miracle is it was so deep and getting deeper as we entered in it. We had to stop being observers and we had to go in the ankles and keep walking in the river, walking up to our knees, walking up to our waist until we couldn't walk anymore and we were face down. Next. Well, then we come back to the banks as we've seen the river and it says... I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. Verse 7, and I'm jumping down to 12. There are fruit trees of many kinds. It's really interesting as we look at the various other places that this tree manifests itself. Manifests itself in the Garden of Eden, the tree of life. And God said, we've got to put Adam and Eve out of the garden lest they eat of the tree and they live eternally. We had access to the tree of life and we lost it. Because God knew as part of redemption, Jesus had to come. But as part of that, we also get the tree of life back again. And so, you know, we can look at Revelation 22, where it talks about right at the end that there's going to be a tree of life that's going to fruit every month and the leaves are going to bring healing to the nations. This wonderful tree. But, you know, I don't believe it's just, oh, we've got to wait till then. Psalm chapter 1 tells us that blessed is the man who does not sit in the seat of the scornful, but what does he do? Meditates on the word day and night. Now, it doesn't mean he reads it day and night. Meditates. Meditates means you might read it in the morning, but you're thinking about it all day. And it says, they are like trees planted along the riverbank just like we saw in Ezekiel, bearing fruit in season, just like we saw in Ezekiel. Their leaves never wither, just like we saw in Ezekiel, and they prosper in all they do. I believe that tree is still have access to us. Jesus said, I came to give life and give it more abundantly. He gave us the potential to that tree. But quite often we want flesh. And we don't choose the tree of life. We choose other trees. So our next. And so we look at more actions. When it empties into the sea, the salty water becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures live wherever the river flows. The salty dead sea becomes back to life. Salt represents the past, where Lot's wife looked back and turned into a pillar of salt. And the saltiness, we're we're dwelling on the past, the blessings of the past. God, what he did with my grandfather, it's wonderful. But I can't live on those blessings. 
I need today's blessing. I need the freshness of the Holy Spirit today. And if we're dwelling on what God did in the past, our life will eventually become salty because we need the freshness every day flowing from that throne of God. And that's the the river because it comes from the source. And the miracle is not only just as it goes deeper and deeper, but the miracle is that it changes the salty water to fresh. That the, when that happens, fish, fish represent evangelism. We want evangelism in the first place, but he's saying, no, come into the presence of God, and when you've got the presence of God, the fish will come. Does that make sense? We've made it, go get believers. Go have this performance. But he's saying, no, you find the presence of God. Jesus says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. We say, I'm going to build the church. No, Jesus said he's going to build the church. Okay? We do church planning. We church growth seminars. That's man. Jesus said, I be lifted up. If the presence of God is here, then the fish will come. And so we've got to know what are we doing and what are we seeking. Yes, we want evangelism. But the way to evangelize is for us to be on fire for God, for us to lift Jesus up. Then the fish will come. So we go to our next slide. But the swamps and the marshes will not become fresh. They will be left with salt. See, swamps are shallow. They didn't want the depth. Yeah, they wanted the water change, but they wanted to keep the past. They wanted to keep something. Religion is going to hold us back. We need the flow of the Spirit. And sometimes we need to change. You know, I've heard Satan doesn't mind the church so long as he can turn the church to be religious. We need a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit. That's what he doesn't want. He wants saltiness of religion to contaminate that water. He wants us to stay shallow and in the marshes. But I want to challenge you, are you ready to go deeper this year? Fishermen will stand along the shore from Engedi to Eglam, and they were a place of spreading of nets, fish of many kinds. When the river flows, there will be fish salvation. There will be fruit. Salvation, fruit of the Holy Spirit. And so we've got to look at the temple. We've got to look at God. We've got to look at that inner sanctum where the river flows. And we've got to go in it. Next. So I said, we've got to swim. Now, at best, I'm probably in the ankles. doesn't matter what you think about me. I don't feel many times that pressure even to my knees. Now, I might go on my knees, but when, I've got to, when God forces me to the knees because of the pressure of the river, then I know I'm at that level. But first of all, it's knees down. But when we're swimming in the river, it's face down. What does that look like? And I think we can look at Paul, this great apostle, the apostle who wrote more of the New Testament than anybody else. So I think, you know, he should have got his doctrine right. And as we look at him and we understand his spiritual growth, 
when he first came into the ministry early on, he said, I am the least of the apostles. Much later, he said, I'm the least of the saints. And finally, just before his death, he says, I'm the worst of sinners. This great man, who we all revere, as he was getting closer in God, as he was going deeper in that river, he wasn't, I've made it. See, I'm the great apostle. Look at me. No. He was repentance. Sometimes when you're feeling God's bringing conviction in your life, it's not because you're in sin, it's because God's saying, I want you to get closer to me. You can't get closer to me with issues in your life. Sometimes it may not be sin. Sometimes it may just be things that are holding us back that are priorities in our life, and he's saying, I want you to sacrifice that to me. When I was young, I used to love chess. And at work, we'd play at morning tea, we'd play at lunchtime, and it was in the, the days of Boris Fisher, and they was doing this amazing, it was on the news, and so we were watching this world championship and we're copying down all the things about chess. I was reading chess books. It was absorbing my mind. I was thinking and absorbing chess at night to go back the next morning and play my next move. Now, I can tell you chess is not sinful. We're not talking about sin here. But it was Something that was preoccupying my time, which meant God had lost that time. And he was saying, I want you to give up chess. I want you to throw all your chess books out because you're spending too much time in the natural. And there can be things that are not wrong, you know, but they're distracting us. This is what repentance looks like. This is what going into the river, that we are willing to give our time. We've got a pool in our house. And our granddaughter lives in New Zealand and she comes over occasionally and she loves to go swimming. But she can be shivering. She still wants to stay in that pool. When we're in that river and we're really swimming, we don't want to come out of the river. I want to let you know that God put this on my heart in December. I was preparing this message. Before I knew what you're going to do after lunch, and I really believe that it's timely for you, What we've done is we've made meetings. We start with praise and worship. We have the offering. We go to the sermon. We've made this the idol of the church. Now, it's important, I understand, for a preaching. But the presence of God is important. We have meetings, but we don't always meet God. Now, I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit this morning. I love the praise and worship. And what you're going to do this afternoon is hopefully just sit in the river and just allow the time. I listen to the Spirit when it's in the meeting. I told you about Paul and, you know, When we're really, we're face down. When we're swimming, we're face down. But the Holy Spirit told you that in one of your songs this morning. When your spirit falls, we fall down in awe. It's in your songs. That's what I want. I want to go deeper. I'm only at the ankles. We need more. I need more. 
I run some healing teaching seminars of a Friday and Saturday night. CJ comes on the Zoom one on the Thursday night. And we teach healing and we see healings. And this week I showed a video, or it was really five videos, you know, I'd edited. One of which was, uh, over the last few weeks we prayed for a, a woman that's got gestational diabetes. And we prayed two weeks ago, and one week ago she went to the doctor, and the doctor says, you no longer have gestational diabetes. Amen. And there are others on there, but my favorite healing is the first one. The first one is a type 1 diabetic. The woman has had diabetes since she's been seven years old, has to... In inject insulin into her body. She's got a, a, measure, a pump and a measurement and she comes to the front and the minister says, the touch of God's on your life. He can see the Holy Spirit. He never prays for her. She wants to be healed and he says, the Holy Spirit's already doing it. He says, can you measure that? Yeah, yeah, I've got my kit in the chair. So she goes back to her chair. Before he prayed or before the meeting, she tested her sugar level, 370. After she came out and she felt the touch of the Holy Spirit, the reading was 80 in a matter of minutes. Without people praying because... There was that river that was flowing. There was the trees with the leaves and the fruit, the leaves for healing and the fruit. And while I believe in prayer and I've prayed for people and people come to me and I see healings from that, that's not my ultimate. My ultimate is to be in the river. And people are just healed in the presence of God. No prayer is required because the leaves of the trees are on the banks of the river. And so it's up to us, church. Go to the next one. It's up to us. Oops. Should be one more. We need to go deeper. I need to go deeper this year. To get away from the natural... to walk knee deep, waist deep, and if God will allow, let me swim. Are you willing to go deeper? What's stopping you? You might have to give up something. Your time, your chest, your other things. See, in our pool, I go under the first step and I dive in. My wife doesn't usually like the pool less than 26 degrees, so you know she'll go in one step, then a second step, then a third step, until she finally gets in. She might be up to her shoulders, but it still takes a bit more time to dive under the water. But she gets in. We've got to be ready to go deeper. What's holding you back? We've got to put aside anything if we want time with God. If we want to go deeper, if we want these things, only in the presence of God. What's the world looking for? Not for smart sermons. You know, I can get better sermons than I can preach on the internet. But I need the presence of God. I need it with a family of believers. And we need to start swimming. And when we get that, there will people be streaming in your doors. But we shouldn't be putting on a performance for the sake of a performance. Our purpose is to lift up God. I saw that this morning. We need to worship him 
seek him and spend time with him. When we do that, we'll st- start seeing things happen and the salt will be changed by the river and will be changed. Are you willing to come this year? Thank you.